Hey guys, a lot of you sent me this Steven Seagal, Jesse Ancom video titled, I Spent 24 Hours with Steven Seagal. Amazing YouTube video, over 700,000 views as of now. So I've always been a big fan and supporter of Steven Seagal doing a bunch of respectful videos out there on YouTube. It would only make sense that I would give some commentary on this. I think this was an absolutely amazing video. And talk about an amazing experience this guy Jesse Ancamp and his brother had. Can you imagine getting to spend some time with Stephen Skull, getting some knowledge, exchanging technique? That's got to be like on every martial artist bucket list, no doubt. It's uh, got to be an amazing experience. Now, the thing that's interesting about Stephen Seagal is that obviously he has a lot of haters online. There's a lot of trolls. But if you speak to real martial artists who are highly experienced, I'm talking like Grandmaster level, uh, they say very great things about Stephen Skull and his martial arts. For example, Hicks and Gracie said some good stuff. Leota Machida said some good stuff and a lot more. It's usually the people who aren't as experienced that uh, don't think he's any good. Anyway, I'm not going to break down the entire video. I will pick certain segments. If you want to see the whole thing, I'll link it in the description below. You've probably already seen it, but it's pretty damn amazing. And this is only part one of two. He's going to do another video or put out the other half. I guess maybe this was 12 hours with Steven Skull. But anyway, I'll go ahead and break some of this stuff down. Here we go. I had no idea what to expect. All I had was this message from somebody who claimed to be Steven's assistant. Can you see him? Maybe this was all just a scam to kidnap me. Where is he? Luckily, I brought my brother Oliver along as my bodyguard. Maybe we should go inside and look. I think he would meet us in the reception. I think it's a good idea that Jesse brought his brother Oliver for protection. That's basically what I do. Uh, this is not my brother, but I bring my cat Oliver for protection. He's uh, quite amazing. He's uh, a naturally gifted fighter, as most cats are. And there he was, the martial arts legend, Steven Seagal. This was a dream come true because I used to make my own action movies as a kid. That's pretty funny. I'm sure a lot of you guys can relate, you know, if your parents had one of those uh, video camcorders. I mean, they were the size of a, like a suitcase back in the day. But yeah, a lot of us used to kind of watch the Steven Skull or Van Damme movies and try to replicate that. I was even doing that in college, man. <laughs> so I'm sure a lot of you guys can relate, but that's, that's pretty cool. He's going to teach Oliver the same kick he taught Anderson Silva and Leota Machida. By the way, speaking of that kick, I do... I think Steven Skull deserves credit for that. You should check out a video I did breaking that down with the martial arts wizard, George Pogacic. I don't know what George is. George is like an alien. Really? I'm more scared of George than any UFC heavyweight champ I ever sparred. Allow me to reintroduce myself. My name is George S. Pogacic. He is the one. But legitimately, he would kill me if he wanted to. It's, uh, it's a great video, and I'm going to give some commentary on Joe Rogan, by the way, a little shortly, because uh, obviously he doesn't necessarily think Seagull deserves credit for that kick, but he doesn't think, uh, he well, he doesn't think highly of Seagull, I'll just put it that way, and I'm going to break that down. The, 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 the difference is we're very careful who we teach this thing. Mm. You know, I actually, I, I do believe that there are techniques that a lot of martial artists will not basically teach you, especially like in a commercial dojo. Going back to the martial arts wizard, George Pogacic, he actually told me well, there are certain things he's even learned in Sistema where sometimes these seminars and stuff, they don't teach you the real stuff. Uh, so I don't know how you necessarily get access to that. Maybe you have to be involved for a certain amount of time. They got to trust you. It's... uh. Maybe it goes to the whole Spider-Man thing, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. So you can't teach anybody some of these techniques. And these techniques you're not even going to want to use. Well, you wouldn't even be allowed to use in, say, like the UFC match or something. When people say all fights end up on the ground, they are incorrect. 90% of the fights that I know end standing up hmm. with one person going horizontal. I, I don't know where he gets the 90% number, but I wouldn't doubt it. Like, I think a lot of people, you know, have been told, oh, you know, the majority of the fights go to the ground. I, from what I've seen, and I've seen quite a few fights, especially growing up, I disagree. It is usually one guy going to the ground, and 
why would you want to go to the ground with that guy if you knocked him down? Dude, in a street fight, usually it's like, well, you kick the guy when he's down. You're not allowed to do that. Another thing you can't do in the UFC or MMA or kickboxing or anything. But that works. Like, why would you go down to the ground with the guy? Especially if you don't know if he's got a friend. You're so damn vulnerable down there. So that statistic, I think, was great for jujitsu as far as like getting people wanting to learn that and go to those schools. Because they figure, well, if I'm in a fight, 90% of fights go to the ground. So you want to learn how to fight on the ground. And of course, there's techniques that you should learn because you might end up down there. But that is the absolute last place you would ever want to be. And I, I and I think the, the truth is more closer to Seagull's stat of like 90% of the fights do not end up on the ground. Like one guy goes down. Sure. I've seen that numerous times. Just as much time as those guys spend trying to dive for your legs and get you, yeah. we spend just as much time cutting your head off or knocking you out or ripping your eyes out or ripping right. your throat out or severing your brainstem when you go down there because your head and your neck will be vulnerable. So that that's a, another good point. Uh, obviously, he's talking like real self-defense. You're not going to do certain things, uh, you know, when you stuff a takedown in the sport of the MMA. But if, if you want to talk about, you know, why spend all your t time training Jiu-Jitsu were on the ground. Look what somebody like Stephen Wonderboy Thompson did. Amazing karate. Once he learned proper takedown defense so he wouldn't get on the ground, he was dominating the ultraweight division. He wasn't dominating because he learned his jiu-jitsu and was fighting guys on the ground. He was able to stay on his feet, and then he would just pick him apart with his brilliant karate, which leave it to someone like him. I'm glad him and Leota Machida that got karate a lot more respect in the UFC when people used to kind of discount it. You should spend a lot of time basically... I would say trying not to get to the ground with that great takedown defense and everything else, at least for like the street. For the sport of MMA, whatever, train your jiu-jitsu, you're going to need it anyway. But if you got great takedown defense and you got great striking, you're going to be pretty damn well off. As the first Westerner to run a dojo in Japan, Sensei Seagal faced lots of adversity, including dojo yaburi, life or death challenges from rival martial arts schools. There are certain very famous people who challenged me. And I said, there'll be no money involved, come with no cameras, no one's going to see it, and there are no rules. No. Did anyone accept? No. No. I don't doubt that at all. You got to talk about, that was like the 70s in Japan. I think we all know martial arts were a lot more hardcore in the, in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s. And then they probably got watered down in the 90s and, and even today, obviously, even more so. But people just get softer. So look at Count Dante and the dojo wars they had in America. If you don't think they had some crazy-ass stuff going in Japan, then, then I don't know what to tell you. But I, I do not doubt uh, what Stephen Skull says here. Great, real samurai says, when I wake up in the morning, I am prepared to die. When I go into battle, I visualize myself as already being dead. Yeah. That's a great mindset to go into. Like, it is much better to go down swinging than to be getting mugged in an alley and just standing there and letting the guy do whatever he does. Even if he robs, he might shoot you after the fact. So you can't take that chance. So when you have that mindset, and ideally you don't have the fear, you won't have the regret. You do need that kind of mindset in a real-life self-defense situation. Obviously, you know, Seagull articulated it well based on kind of that samurai philosophy. This is coming. And just like that, it was time to head to the dojo. But first, I wanted to talk to this guy. What is it like to be Steven Seagal's practice dummy? Uh, <laughs> is it a lot of pain? Yeah, yeah, a lot of pain, yes. Okay. This is my job, kind of, you know? <laughs> There's pros and cons with this guy. Being able to train with Seagal all the time, you know, learning from the great master is, is one thing. But taking all those falls and everything else, uh, you know, he's kind of like a, a real-life stuntman in a way. <laughs> Getting battered and bruised. That part I would, I would pass. I'm not, I wouldn't be interested in that myself. Very unusual job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm excited. Let's have fun. I think you will uh, taste this too. You think? <laughs> <laughs> this is my fighting pose. Yeah. And from here... I might do this. Mm. I've already killed you, but I have this now. Ah. From here, I have this. From here, come around here, brother. And look here. We break it. That's cool, man. I like uh, I like Steven Skull's fighting pose. It's it's very unassuming, but he's ready. I mean, he doesn't need to keep his hands up in the fighting pose and, 
and having the other guy think like a fight's going to go down, you don't really want to uh, turn it up that level unless you absolutely have to. So he's got awareness, basically. He's got awareness, and he's already thinking ahead. In a real-life situation, it's perfect. People normally will not punch you like this. Right. They normally won't punch you like this. They'll punch you like this. Haymaker. Right? Kind That's of right. Yeah. So as he comes, you'll notice something very different. Uh-huh. This in sword is called uke nagash. So when the sword comes down, I'll show you yep. him. You see the sword? Yeah. This is a sword. Ah. So this is when I suddenly realized what we were actually practicing. Yeah, see, that makes a lot of sense. And the point that people like Joe Rogan are missing where he'll say... His Aikido is outstanding. The real question is, <laughs> how effective is Aikido? It was used in battle with samurais and swords. If you drop your weapon, he kind of will allude to like it's useless otherwise in, in any other scenario where... Think about it, like in a weapon, a lot of weapons in general are just like an extension of your arm. So a lot of these movement patterns are very similar. Obviously, they're not exactly the same but they're close enough where you can adapt them. So Steven Skull doing these Aikido moves in defenses against swords, yeah, you can utilize that against a haymaker. I don't doubt that at all. But see, that's a simple thing that someone like Joe Rogan, who's pretty damn experienced in martial arts, should know. Look, man, I I like Joe Rogan overall, but honestly, some of the stuff, he's, he's just, it, it doesn't make sense. Like, for example, one of the things that uh, I know a lot of people were questioning him was that Chris Cuomo video where he had these 100 pound dumbbells and he's just picking them up like this. Like, do you understand how heavy <laughs> that is when you're holding it like this? Like, I don't care how strong you are. Like, you can hold it like this. You can hold it, you're not gonna just move it like in that direction. So just the physics alone and understanding weights, which obviously Joe Rogan weight trains, but he's like, oh no, that's just that Italian Guido strength. It's like, look, I don't doubt some of these guys in general, some guys have like crazy man strength, natural man strength, but you're not holding a hundred pound dumbbell like that. But see, even Joe Rogan like was fooled by that. And he was also fooled by other things with Steven Skull where uh, there was like a movie picture from one of his movies. And he was like, oh, uh, Steven Seagal is, is fighting on the front lines for Russia. And I think it was uh, a CNN article, which already automatically you got to say, well, that's probably not real and fake news. But it turned out like it was a fake CNN article. But again, that fools Rogan. Even if it was something real from CNN, he should be like, yeah, I don't think I believe that because come on, he, he knows CNN is full of crap. So anyway, that's, that's what I got to say about Rogan. And he should understand some of these Aikido techniques are applicable because weapons are like extensions of your arms and you could use a lot of the same movement patterns. Real world application outside of like trying to defend yourself against a sword comes into play real life a lot more than you would think kicking but what i try to do you know is a kick where you don't see it ah it's more like a spear just like that's brilliant that's brilliant see again people can't grasp that these like little subtle modifications make all the difference in the world but they say, oh, it's a front kick. You learned that in your first week in karate class. Steven Skull didn't teach him a front kick. Like, you know, like what Seagal's doing. Like, Seagal, that's a front kick, man. <laughs> he knows that's a front kick. Of course he didn't teach him a front kick. He teach them a modified way to do it. Just like if you were to throw a jab, anybody could throw a jab. You don't think somebody could show you how to make it more effective and sharper? It's not like they taught you a jab. It's like they taught you a better way to do the jab. And I think I think a lot of people can benefit from that. So I, I just don't get why people were giving them so much crap about the front kick. Even in the comments section on that video I made with George Pocket said, it's like, guys, you are thinking from such like an elementary level. It's like, come on, open your mind. Of course he didn't teach him a front kick. He He modified it. He refined it. Dude, I've been throwing kicks for, um, I don't know, 27 years. I'm still looking for ways to, like, make them better and modify them. And, and I'll do that the rest of my life because nobody's technique ever is going to be perfect. It could be near flawless and be very effective. But anybody who says, oh, my technique is perfect, well you're deluding yourselves you you could somebody a, a master could get near perfection but even they know it nothing is perfect so i, I just i you know the whole front kick thing 
It's an easy way to attack Seagull by taking things out of context. Yeah, just don't lift your knee. Mm. Put your foot straight there. Yeah. Oh, okay. Big difference. So from the hip more, yes. more than the knee. And don't push him. Cut him. Yeah, yeah, yeah because you don't Did show... You see the light go on when he... You know, the best way I would describe that is kind of like a hybrid between a front kick and a push kick. Like... When he when he says it's a spear, it it like hits right at that extension in an angle. So, yeah, I mean the best way to to describe it to people, I think, from what I've seen, and and you know, I like I said, I, I modify my kicks. It's kind of like a hybrid between a front kick and a and a push kick, essentially. So he's doing this. Yes, yes. I'm doing this. Whoa. <laughs> Yeah, you can't tell when you're looking. It's no. way different when you feel it. <laughs> yeah, when he says you can't tell when you're looking, it's way different than you feel it. Here's an amazing analogy that George Pogacic gave me, martial arts wizard. Basically, you got to think of it like this. And and this is a, a reason why a lot of techniques say you, you'll see videos on like Russian Sistema. And it doesn't look like much. And probably over 90% of those videos aren't much. But the 10% that probably are legit, you don't really get it. You don't see it you, because you haven't experienced it. You got to think of it. He told me a guy basically swimming and then all of a sudden like he drowns. You, you look at the video. Oh, that guy sucks at swimming. What you don't see or don't notice is like an undertow underwater that pulls him. You, he experienced it. He knows like he could be a great swimmer, but... It doesn't matter. That thing's pulling him under. What we see is like, oh, this dude sucks at swimming. So you got to think of it like at a higher level. You need to try that in your next fight. Would that even be legal? Some of it's not legal. Yeah, no, that's exactly. the thing. You can't do the finger stuff either. You can supposedly if you have all of them. Yeah, yeah. All of them are legal, but they never do it. No. See, that's another thing like why Aikido gets a bad rap. Some of this stuff you cannot legally do uh, in like an MMA fight. And everyone, again, will use... The UFC or MMA as like the end-all be-all, does something work? And what might work in a cage may not necessarily work in the street and vice versa, but the point is another issue. People see these drills that these Akadokos do, and yes, they're going along with the techniques. They're doing this, and you know, a lot of it is very gentle. What they don't see is what Steven Seagal and his Tenshin Aikido and the pre-war Akujitsu does where they're on the offense and it's not just this defensive art. Yeah, of course, you're not going to get some very peaceful Aikido guy in there. And all he's going to do is deflect punches and redirect the guy's weight. Yeah, nobody's going to fight like that. And somebody who truly knows and understands Aikido would not want to fight like that. There's no point, especially in MMA. Uh, people are limited in, in what they believe about Aikido. And a lot of it you can probably be blamed because of a lot of these schools. Like uh, Remy, Aikido master from Norway... Uh, talked about this. Uh, he's a real life badass doing security work, bouncer work, etc. And he can use Aikido techniques and principles, though, more importantly, principles, not just the techniques, but principles, and has a better understanding on how violent that art can actually be. Another guy I'm going to have on the channel soon that I talked to, Prince Garius, amazing Aikido master. And he, funny enough, trained with Steven Skull for years back in the late 90s, and he's going to provide some further understanding and clarity on how freaking badass and legit Aikido actually is. So hopefully these videos will build more awareness. And I think this video with Seagull and Enkamp is actually doing a lot to not only help Aikido, but also Steven Seagull because he looks amazing in this. It's great to see him in a dojo setting, uh, given his knowledge and helping people better understand some of this stuff. You have to fight somebody to end it immediately. But in the case that you can't end it immediately, you never let him fight his style. Right. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Kind of like Cobra Kai. Uh, strike first, strike hard. No mercy. As far as not letting a guy fight his style, that actually makes a lot of sense. You know, it's actually kind of funny when you train in different things like boxing. A boxer can work well against a boxer because he's used to boxers. So his defense works against boxing. Just like a Taekwondo guy used to seeing all these head kicks coming. He's defensively great against other taekwondo guys whereas you get a taekwondo and a boxer guy you know the taekwondo guy why, why are you going to box the boxer why are you going to try to throw kicks with the taekwondo guy if you're the boxer so 
yeah, don't let him fight his fight. Uh, and there are a lot of techniques that work really great against boxers, but there are other techniques that work great against Taekwondo guys. So, you know, whatever the other guy's good at, use something else. Don't try to outbox a boxer if you know the boxer is better than you. There's so many things you could do that are really effective against a boxer, especially if you're not a boxer yourself. Yes. You always would break his rhythm yes. and his timing so that he can't fight his style. With he you know, breaking rhythm and timing, basically being a pressure fighter. Like if you guys have sparred, you'll it, it's almost amazing how much more tired you get if you're on the defense. Teach all the beginners to find a rhythm, to find a certain rhythm. But then at some point you need to learn how to break the rhythm. So you don't you break their rhythm. Yeah, yeah. But well, when you're the aggressor, it's pretty hard for them to break your rhythm. In our style, we are completely offensive. Mm. Completely aggressive. You know, it's funny. I've always... <laughs> you would think these two arts couldn't be more different, Aikido and Krav Maga. But I, there, there's so much similarity between the two. It's actually kind of funny. As far as, like, the awareness and the attitude and things like that. But again... Like Remy pointed out, uh, Dan the Wolfman points out, even Prince Garius, I'm sure Seagull himself would point this out. They don't properly teach Aikido the way it was meant to be taught in a lot of schools, and, and that's one reason why it does not necessarily have the best reputation. And I think we can all safely say Rokus was in one of those schools, right? Rokus from the Martial Arts Journey, and why he doesn't really think Aikido is all that, even though... Uh, He's trained in it for so long. Maybe he will come full circle, though, uh, learning all these different arts, because he, he's doing like a lot of MMA training, kickboxing, etc. He comes back to Aikido with those skills, because I think, again, like I, a lot of people, I don't necessarily think should go straight into Aikido. I think they should have a nice background and some other stuff. Seagull himself does. And then when they discover Aikido and apply these techniques and principles, it, it adds so much. But then they have, you know, obviously specific aikido techniques as well but it's really like the concepts i think that adds so much so who knows maybe rokas comes full circle and becomes a badass akidoka and really in real life if you want to end it immediately you have to attack first yeah that's better because a lot of times you know you're going to have that upper hand especially if you if you get them the really hard shot i mean sometimes that's all that's needed and the guy can't even recover but just catching them, you know, off guard like that. How about in the eyes of the law? If you look like uh, the aggressor. I don't want to sound terrible because. Well, you're above I the law. I used to be a police uh -huh. officer. Oh, yeah, that's true. But I don't care no. about the law. No. If I have to fight, I don't care about the law. Yeah. I care about ending it quick. It's the attitude you need. And, uh, you know, Stephen Skull is technically above the law, right? We're here. Mm. We do this a lot. Mm. And this would actually be the dagger that a samurai would. That's right. Yeah. And I'm coming in here and in here. Mm. Once in a while, we'll come in here. And you yeah. can feel that, right? I, I mean, can. This, this, yeah. because I train it every day. Yeah. This, you know, is very dangerous. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And you can imagine if I did that in your throat. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I could definitely see the benefit to that. You know, a lot of those old school martial arts, will, I mean, not only are they doing finger push ups, I mean, Bruce Lee doing the one finger push ups. Uh, pull-ups, chin-ups, and even just digging them like in rocks or in sand. I could definitely see that being a pretty deadly weapon. Uh, you have extra range on it too, and you're gonna feel it because it's more pinpoint. You're gonna, you're gonna, re it could really dig in. So I, I do see the benefit of that. Yeah, that's a throat strike. One of the worst strikes I've seen. Two children fighting in a karate tournament. Yeah. Punch in the throat. She spit her mouthpiece out, walked two steps, and then just collapsed. Did she die or? No, uh, she was carried out on a stretcher. Yeah. Stretcher, yeah. See, again, that's not something that's going to be legal in an MMA fight. But if you look at some of these traditional martial arts, and I'll say uh, some of the stuff I learned from like Kenpo Karate is some of the ugliest as far as like most brutal stuff, where they they actually do have these throat strikes. You know, you kind of use more like um, like a tiger paw, and just you know, because obviously it's going to slip in a lot easier than a uh, than a fist you know but yeah with steven skull's fingers you even got more range now this is obviously safer if your fingers aren't strengthened but again you're doing 
moves like this and you're doing your your claws on somebody's face and so again like these traditional martial arts i think get a bad rap but for self-defense you'd be a lot more functional and effective than stuff you'd learn in an mma gym sport fighting because like with uh kempo for example you do have that strike like that in the throat and you got like your your claws on the face and all kinds of stuff like that you know and krav maga some of the principles like when you're kneeing a guy you're literally digging your fingers and nails in the guy's tricep as you're holding him and obviously you're you you know you're guarding against a takedown defense with the other arm as you're kneeing the guy and you're like looking around so a lot of this these combatives you know bring world world awareness and you just gotta assume you're not fighting one guy for example when you come to grab my leg i'll hit you in the eyes like this on the way down that's actually a really good takedown offense now even if you if you aren't able to attack the eyes it doesn't really matter it's one of those things where look the, you're gonna stuff the guy pretty good if you get the eyes that's just a bonus so even in like krav maga if you're like getting choked from behind for example you know obviously you want to break that choke but you could literally go for for like the eyes and if you don't get them you don't get them and it's not a big deal but hey you might as well at least go for them because like let, you're gonna throw your arm back you know try to get the eye jab and then get out of the choke so you get the eyes it's just a bonus same with uh, th this takedown offense one of my masters once said which means real buge is like lightning it is the culmination between energy between heaven and earth and an explosion when they meet. And what's really cool about this, so obviously Seagull's showing techniques and then providing wisdom and understanding. And look how fluent he is in Japanese. Here's something interesting, by the way. So you know certain languages, they have different words and meanings and way they, they describe things. So for example, if you speak one language whatever concept that they're talking about, sometimes you can't even translate into another language. So the fact that Seagull understands the Japanese language so well, he has a better understanding of a lot of this stuff that may not necessarily be translated or articulated as well for understanding like in the English language, even though he tries to do it as best he can here. But again, being completely ensconced in the Japanese culture and the language, he's going to have a better understanding from a lot of these uh, martial arts principles and everything else than, than somebody who only speaks English who's learned them in America, in my opinion. That's beautiful. <laughs> what, wasn't it Musashi that Mus said... Miyamoto Musashi said, yeah. make your everyday stance your fighting stance, make your fighting stance your everyday stance. What did you just see? Yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah. You'll see me standing like this all the time. Yeah. One great samurai once said, when a tiger dies, even though we have appreciated him in life, we take his pelt and we hang it on the wall, and that's what he's remembered by, his pelt. Uh, speaking of that, <laughs> if you look at this bookcase, I got, I got uh, quite a few pelts up here. You know, the Steven Seagal pelt, a uh, Seagology book, Above the Law, Glimmer Man. I got this lone pelt, Rambo. <laughs> you know, Van Damme pelt, obviously, with double impact, uh... Um, sudden death, no retreat, no surrender, blood sport, kickboxer. So <laughs> it's like uh, if these guys were tigers, they're pelt. It's on the wall right here. When a real warrior dies, he has to be remembered by what he did in life. His technique, his waza, his ability and desire to teach, mm. and what he left his students what he left the world it's interesting what he says about kind of like a legacy you leave behind and here's what i think basically that uh as far as like the afterlife is concerned like here's my theory on everything whatever you do in your life it, it, it makes sense if you're recycled back into the system somehow whether there's another human being an animal etc uh, so I don't know what you guys think about reincarnation or not, but let me tell you why this makes the most sense. Think about what kind of impact you've had on Earth, either positive or negative. You you either left here, leaving, uh, you know, making the world a little bit better of a place or a little bit worse of a place. Your individual impact has affected other people and other specific things. So that's why your life, anyone's life, is not meaningless at all because you're going to come back to this and and whatever you did here 
you're going to come back to like a slightly better place or a slightly worse place. That is what we call a legacy. Yes. And it's another reason why I'm doing this interview. Yeah. Because in America, you have guys like Gene LaBelle and Bob Wall, these people who every time their mouth opened, they were lying. You know, speaking about Gene LaBelle, it is, it is interesting. And I did videos with uh, a couple of guys. One of them, stuntman Stephen Lambert, who was there during the whole Gene LaBelle Seagull incident on the set for Mark for Death. And look, the story out there, Seagal got choked out and defecated himself is a lie. I even had a follow-up video later with Conrad Palmasano, the actual stunt coordinator. He said, look, they were they were showing off some techniques to each other. They were horsing around a little bit. That was it. That's a stand-up guy. So we have actual witnesses. See, the thing is, people want to believe that story for whatever reason. And uh, I, I don't think that's fair to Seagal, but... I'm pretty sure he's seen my videos, by the way. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. You know, I'm trying to get the truth out there. But look at this uh, autographed picture from Steven Seagal. Two Viking Samurai. Keep up the truth. Signed Steven Seagal. How freaking awesome is that, man? So, yeah. This is, this is the sad thing about America. You can destroy someone's life, yeah. their legacy, their reputation just by making up lies. As soon as I spoke the truth about certain things that are happening in the world, yeah. a huge campaign on a secret, very top secret level yeah. was mounted. 50 people were paid to say all kinds of things about me uh, to destroy me. Yeah, yeah. I actually don't doubt that. I actually do not doubt that. So I know this is probably going to generate a lot of comments, but... A lot of those stories you heard about Seagal, a lot of the negative stuff, and, and you have all these different allegations. Look, not, nothing happened with them aside from tarnishing his reputation. If there was legit evidence and, and proof and, and all this other stuff, he would have been arrested. He would have probably been in jail or paid some huge fines or whatever. None of that happened. So that tells a lot. Now, as far as like America being full of lies, whether you like Donald Trump or not, one very positive thing I think that he brought was bringing awareness with, you know, coining the whole phrase and making it popular, fake news. And then we see a network like CNN who basically brands itself as the most trusted news network. It is absolutely disgusting some of the narrative that they put out there because if you just do a little bit of research yourself and you should – you will realize, holy crap, did they twist this? Did they take it out of context? It's It shouldn't even be legal, man. Yeah. I'm not gonna put up with that. No. So I just left. Mm. But when a great warrior or a great samurai dies, he has a real legacy. And people who have real ethics and morals and decency, they admire the people that have technique and have history and have teachers, have teachers, yeah. and they would never try to tarnish what they are. No. See, again, like I was saying, the people who've experienced uh, Seagal's martial arts and know more about the man, they speak so damn highly about him. Like Leota Machida, ex-light heavyweight UFC champion, like Hicks and Gracie, amazing jujitsu uh stylist and and so many others like i, I i've uh, met and talked to a lot of grandmasters and they're like yeah steven seagull is basically the shit and i don't know why he gets a bad rap well steven skull explained it why he gets a bad rap you know because if people try to ruin his reputation but true masters know that this guy is the real deal and i've always known that i'm not like a grandmaster but I've, I've been around martial arts long enough to know that steven skull is a he knows his stuff, man. There's no doubt. And I'm also intelligent enough to know that Aikido is not shit. But uh, yeah, a lot of the stuff you see out there is. But a lot of the stuff you see on a lot of stuff is shit. You know, you just got to filter it out. And you can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. America's different. Yeah. They don't care. Where I came from, if you did that, somebody will come and kill you the next day. Yeah. They'll come to your dojo or your house and say, it's on right now. Yeah. One of us is going to live and yeah. one of us is going to die. Yeah. Or one of us is going to be unconscious and maybe he'll live and maybe he won't. I don't care. Yeah. That's how it was. Yeah. That's how I was raised. Yeah. 
again, that, that mindset and mentality, uh, you know, he had a very popular interview on The Voice years back where, um, you know, the host asked him, uh, what, what do you think about Jean-Claude Van Damme or, and Michael Jai White, if they're tough guys, if they're martial artists, and uh, he really didn't give them a lot of credit. Do I think Michael is a tough guy? No. Do I think he's a martial artist? No. Do I think Jean-Claude's a tough guy or a martial artist? No. But again, his martial arts background is quite a bit different. Now, with that said, obviously, you know, I'm a huge Van Damme fan, so I, I, I respect Van Damme. As a, as a martial arts and a tough guy, uh, I think Michael Jai White is too, to some degree. But, uh, you know, Steven Skull is just, he, he's got a different level of what he considers, you know, to be these tough guy martial arts. I mean, you got to figure this guy is living in Russia now. And, and I'm pretty sure some of the guys he hangs out with, those are the things that guys in movies do, uh, but they do in real life. So that that's kind of like the crowd he probably hangs out with. <laughs> In that respect, then, then sure, most people aren't like badasses, right? But but I do I, I do consider Van Damme much as I white martial artists, of course. There are people who say I did this and I did this and I did that, and I studied all these martial arts, but none of them can tell you the names of their teachers or where they study. None of them. That is funny because it 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 does tie into a lot of stuff going that went on in the eighties and nineties. You know, you have all these guys that they, they would have to kind of manufacture a, a history and a background, uh, and they're like 10th degree masters, and, you know, when you look into them, it's hard to find a lot of evidence uh, to support their claims and their their um, rank, but we didn't really have the internet back then. People couldn't really check it. You would just kind of have to, to go with it, and we had movies I think that exaggerated, well, obviously exaggerated things. So the people in real life had to exaggerate their background to be more like these characters in the movies to get people interested in learning martial arts. Now, with that said, I kind of had a unique experience because I grew up on army bases in the 80s and I literally seen soldiers come back with martial arts. They were like stationed in different countries, obviously a lot of Asian countries. Uh, my neighbors used to do jujitsu in the in the yard in the 80s, and we had like a real life ninja that lived down the street. And there's some crazy stuff this guy did. I, I don't think you really see people do what he did now. I think that guy was a re legit, true, whatever trained badass. Uh, you know, cutting apples blindfolded off the top of kids' heads. I shared that story before, but that, I ain't making that up, man. Uh, and again, you're not even gonna have parents allowing their kids to volunteer to do that these days but this guy like come on man that's some skill and some technique and i'm pretty damn sure he picked that up in japan somewhere man <laughs> we used to throw like knives throwing knives in his uh tool shed man and he could just do them like perfect like you would see in a, a ninja movie or something it was kind of amazing i didn't think too much of it back in the day when i was a kid because i just figured you know reading black belt magazine or seeing movies like yeah guys like this you know there's there's guys like that in real life but then when you get older, you're like, no, that's really movie stuff. But I'm telling you, that was one of those dudes in real life, man. Pretty, pretty incredible. But Steven Seagal, in my opinion, is one of these guys that can do a lot of that stuff in real life. Obviously, he did it in movies. But I'm telling you, this guy's uh, at a much higher level than most people. And I think the true masters actually realize and know that. But, you know, internet trolls, they can say what they're going to say. And uh, if they met the man and trained with him, I'm sure they'd change their mind and be like, oh, shit, I was wrong about Steven Seagal. Even when you do like martial arts and stuff, like the way you carry yourself somehow. I think it's different, it's such a different when I'm thinking about some of the fighters that I train with that have no spirituality in them at all. And the ones that come from a more traditional background. You see, the way they carry themselves is way different. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that, man. So with MMA training and MMA gyms and some other stuff, I see a lot of pros and cons. Look, there's, there's nothing necessarily wrong about as far as like just getting right down to the martial part instead of the arts and the spiritual elements. I mean, even Krav Maga is like, you know, we're more martial than art. That is what they say. So there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. But I do think you you do miss out on a lot of really important things. That's why even some guys in the UFC will say, I'm a fighter. I'm not a martial artist, which, which is true in many, many ways. Very perceptive. In the next video, I receive an amazing gift from Sensei Seagal. Plus, we learn his invisible punch, an incredible kick defense, and the truth about Bruce Lee. Like any other human being, he was human. 
You don't want to miss this. I can't wait for part two to come out. That's going to be incredible, man. So anyway, comment below. What do you think of uh, some of this breakdown? What do you think about Steven Seagal? I know this community, the channel has always been very pro Steven Seagal. Uh, in general because I am you know like I want to be a fair guy I, I think there's so many videos and and people out there especially on the internet who are unfair towards Steven Skull so the channel is kind of a counterbalance to a lot of that but this Jesse Encamp video with this many views and all this this is really going to be great for his reputation and legacy in my opinion to help it uh, yeah I've always thought very highly of him but this is the kind of stuff where it's you know I've been doing my part on my channel He's got a much bigger channel, really just kind of seeing Seagull himself out there in a very positive light just with his technique and his knowledge and, and everything else. Really amazing stuff. So good for Jesse and good for Seagull.